This video will go over the underlying concepts involved in working with rotational kinetic energy. The objectives of this video are to introduce the concept of an equation for rotational kinetic energy, to apply the concept of rotational kinetic energy to rotating systems, and to use energy conservation to solve problems for systems involving rotating objects. Okay, so just to introduce rotational kinetic energy, uh, anything that's rotating obviously has bits that are moving, so it has rotational kinetic energy. The energy depends on the rotational inertia of the object and the angular speed of the object. So here's our equation for rotational kinetic energy. It's half I omega squared. And the rotational kinetic energy is uh, given the symbol e, K, e subscript k rotational, and it's measured in joules. The rotational inertia is I, um, and that is measured in kilogram meters squared. And omega is the angular velocity of the rotating object in radians per second. So this is the, the key equation for this whole topic. Just to give an, a, an idea of where this equation comes from, we can consider a, a rotating, sort of a, a fixed, a wheel with a fixed axis, which is able to rotate about that axis. So if we think of the wheel as being stationary and it has a string wrapped around it, which we can then pull by applying a force to a tension force to the string this way. So if we pull the string with a force F over a distance d then we'll do work on it, and the work will be the force that we apply multiplied by the distance over which we apply it, as we learned in year 12. Uh, this work that we do will cause the wheel to increase its angular velocity. And the kinetic energy that the wheel gains will be equal to uh, however much work we do on the wheel. So, um, the work that we do in pulling the string will cause the wheel to increase its angular velocity and the total work that we've done will be equal to the rotational kinetic energy that the wheel gains. I'll use this concept to derive the equation clearly at the end of the presentation. Uh, that's extension but it's good to know kind of where the equation comes from. Okay so just to look at an example here. So if we have a car wheel a rotational inertia 2 kilogram meters squared and it's accelerated from rest to 10 revolutions per second. How much work did the car motor have to do on the wheel? Okay, so for this first question, what we can do is, let's just draw a little diagram, and um, we can say that it's moving at a speed omega. Oops, let's go back here. It's rotating at a speed omega, which is 10 revolutions per second. Um, and it has a rotational inertia I equals 2.0 kilogram meters squared. Okay, so first thing we want to do is convert this angular velocity to um, the correct units. So omega is equal to 10 times 2 pi, that's the angular displacement, and the time that it takes for it to go through that angular displacement is 1 second, so that's just 20 pi uh, radians per second. And we'll leave that unrounded because we're going to use it in our calculation. Then the um, final rotational kinetic energy, E k rotational is equal to one half i omega squared which is one half times 2.0 times 20 pi all squared which is equal to so 0 0.5 times 2 times 20 times pi squared is 3,948 joules. 
and it should be to two significant figures, so that's 3.9 joules of work has been done. And this is also also how much um, rotational kinetic energy the wheel gains. So now we have said how much work needed to be done on the wheel and how much rotational kinetic energy it gained as a result. Okay. In many situations we have objects that are both translating and rotating. So in other words they're, they're both spinning and they're moving through space. They will have both translational kinetic energy, which we learned all about in year 11 and year 12. That's rotational. So the translational kinetic energy is, is just half mv squared, where v is the speed at which the center of mass is moving through space. And it will also have rotational kinetic energy, which is half i omega squared. So it has kind of a, a com combination of those two types of energy. A rolling object, so if you have a, an object like this, um, that is rolling down a hill. So here we have this, this object here is going to be both moving down this way and rotating about its own center of mass. Its total energy will be um, half mv squared because it's moving through space and half i omega squared because it's rotating about its own axis. So it'll have a total kinetic energy that is equal to um, the sum of the two. One little point that I want to go back over from earlier in this topic is that for a rolling object um, the center of mass will be moving forward while the object also spins on its own axis. If we focus just on the object and we keep the object in, in center view and let the ground kind of pass underneath, then a point on the rim of the object will move exactly the same distance, as will, will move one circumference in one rotation, but the object will also roll forward a distance equal to the circumference. So if the um, angular displacement is 2 pi radians, then the displacement of the object along the ground will be 2 pi times the radius. Um, but obviously both of these things took the same amount of time, so the speed is going to be 2 pi r over t, that's the distance that the ball has moved divided by the time that it took, while the angular displacement is just going to be 2 pi over t, because it will have spun through 2 pi radians as it moved that distance, and so we can relate the um, translational velocity of the object to the rotational velocity of the object by this equation v equals omega r. Okay, and this is important because it allows us to work to kind of figure out how much rotational kinetic energy something will have if we know its speed because we can just and its radius because we can just convert. Okay, so looking at an example of a rolling object, if we have a stationary wheel of mass 1.6 kilograms rotational inertia 0 0.50 kilogram meters squared and a radius of 0 0.4 meters and we give it a push along the ground so that it ends up rolling at 5 meters per second. So firstly, how much translational kinetic energy does it gain? So Ek is equal to 1 half mv squared and that is going to be equal to 1 half times the mass here is 1.6 times the final speed which was 5 um, and that will be equal to that says 5 squared yeah and that'll be equal to let's have a look 0 0.5 times 1.6 times 5 squared gives us 20 
20 joules. Okay, the second part asks us to figure out how much rotational kinetic energy it gains. So we need to figure out then what EK rotational is, and that should be a half I omega squared. Now, we weren't given omega, but we were given the linear speed that it ends up at, right? So we first need to find omega, and we know that omega is equal to V over R for a rolling object, as we learned in the previous slide. And so that's going to be equal to 5 divided by the radius, which is 0 0.4. And that will be 5 over 0 0.4 gives us 12.5. radians per second. Okay, and then we can find the EK, ro EK rotational. Will be a half times the um, rotational inertia, which is given here, 0 0.50, times the angular speed squared, which is 12.5 all squared which gives us 76.25 joules and we were given thanks to two significant figures so we should really say 1.7 I'm sorry 1.8 times 10 to the 2 joules so 180 joules all right so the work that we do on an object that will both translate and rotate uh, will go into giving it both translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy, and the work will be equivalent to the total energy gain. So here's a harder example, and this is taken straight from an exam. This is from the 2010 exam, and this was question 1c in that exam. So we have a cyclist that accelerates to a speed of 5.5 meters per second. The wheels have a rotational inertia of 0 0.640 kilogram meters squared, and there are two of those, right? So we can remind ourselves that there are two wheels and an outer diameter of 0 0.724 meters. So that means, and we should remind ourselves that R is equal to diameter over two. The cyclist and cycle have a total mass of 68.4. How much work did the cyclist need to do to get, this speed, get to this speed? All right, so here what we need to do is again recognize that work is equal to total energy gained which will be equal to e k of the cycle plus e k rotational of the wheels Okay, so we're going to need to add those two things up. So EK cycle is going to be equal to a half mv squared, which is equal to a half times the mass, the combined mass of everything, 68.4, times the speed, 
which is 5.5 .5 squared. Okay, so let's work that out now. 0 0.5 times, oops, I'll just, okay. 0 0.5 times 68.4 times 5.5 .5 squared. Let's try that again. 0 0.5 times 1034.55 I'm not going to round that yet because I'm still going to use it in my calculation EK rotation of the wheels is going to be equal to well let's work it out for one wheel so it's going to be 2 times half I omega squared and we know I we're given that here that's I and we can figure out omega because we know the speed of the bike and we know that the wheels will rotate um, at a speed to give the bike that speed so we know that omega is going to be equal to V over R which is 5.5 .5 divided by half of this number here Let's just write it in like that. 0 0.5 times 0 0.724, which is 0 0.5 times 0 0.724, which gives us an angular speed of 15.19. radians per second. So now we have all the information we need to find the rotational kinetic energy. So E K rotational is equal to two because we have two wheels times one half times 0 0.640 which is the rotational inertia times 15.19 squared which gives us 2 times 0 0.640 times 15.19 squared I forgot the 0.5 um, I'll divide that by 2. So 147.67. 147.67 joules. So the total energy gained gained is equal to um, 1034.55 plus 147.67 which gives us a total energy gained of what was it uh, 1034.55 of 1182.22 and this is also the work done Okay, so and note that we have ignored friction here. If there were friction, then not all of the work that we did would go into uh, kinetic energy. So our final answer here for these two would be different. Okay, so this is really the same process that we went through for the easier question before, but here we had two wheels to deal with and we weren't given the radius, we were given the diameter, so we had a few little extra steps to do. Okay, now looking at energy conservation, so um, we can now work with energy conservation that also involves rotating things. So we learned last year that energy is always conserved 
even though we sometimes will lose a little bit of energy to the environment. That energy is technically not gone, it's just become heat and other things that have been sort of dissipated to the environment. In situations involving rotating objects, we also need to take into account rotational kinetic energy. So if you consider this um, situation that's in this picture here, we have a mass suspended from a string that's wrapped around a wheel. And as the mass falls, it will lose gravitational potential energy. The mass will gain kinetic energy, but as it falls, the string will also cause the wheel to start to turn, so it will gain rotational kinetic energy. Oops, I'll just go back. So um, what we see is that the energy that's been lost is just the gravitational potential energy of the mass. The energy that's been gained by the system is the total, total kinetic energy. And so we can write that E lost will be equal to E gained because energy is conserved. So our energy conservation equation for this situation looks like this. Mg, oops, mg delta H is equal to a half mv squared plus a half i omega squared. And this equation would then allow us to deduce information about a system uh, based on the fact that we know that the energy can't change. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll try applying that to a situation with some real numbers. So here we have the mass is 1.5 kilograms. And the wheel, so it reaches a speed of 3 meters per second. So down here, the speed, oops, the speed is 3.0 meters per second. Um, and the wheel has a radius of 0 0.4 meters. Um, how much gravitational potential energy does the mass lose? So this is, um, we're just looking at the green mass here. So EP lost is equal to mg delta H, which is equal to the mass was 1.5 times 9.81 times 1.2, which gives us 1.5 times 9.81 times 1.2 gives us 17.658 joules. Okay, how much translational kinetic energy did it gain? E K gained is equal to a half M V squared, which is equal to a half times one point five times three squared six point seven five joules. Okay, and then we're asked to work out how much rotational kinetic energy the wheel gained. So we know that the energy that it lost, 17.658 joules, must have been converted to kin translational kinetic energy plus rotational kinetic energy. So we can say EP lost is equal to EK gained plus EK rotational gained. So, therefore, um, E k rotational gained must be equal to 17.658 minus 6.75, which gives us 17.658 10.908 joules. So in this case, what happened was the mass lost potential energy, 17.658,
This was the total energy available to the system. 6.75 joules of that energy went to translation and 10.908 joules of that energy went to rotation of the wheel. Okay, what is the final angular velocity of the wheel? Okay, so we don't know the rotational inertia of the wheel, but there is a way that we can find this out. So we know that if the mass has a speed of 3 meters per second, then the string is moving at 3 meters per second, which means that a point on the rim of the wheel must be moving at 3 meters per second. So we can say omega is equal to v over r, because if a point on the rim is work moving at 3 meters per second, then the wheel must be spinning at an angular speed of 3 divided by the radius. So that is equal to 3 over, and the radius here is 0 0.4, and so that is Seven point five radians per second. And finally, what's the wheel's rotational inertia? Well, we know, we already know, the rotational kinetic energy was ten point nine oh eight. E K rotational is equal to a half I omega squared. And we know ek rotational, and we know omega, so the only thing we don't know is i. So we should rearrange this equation for i. And i will be equal to 2 ek rotational over omega squared, which is equal to 2 times 10.908 divided by 7.5 squared gives us 0 0.39 0 0.39 kilogram meters squared so in this situation we use the fact that the total energy lost was known that was 17.658 here and we use the fact that we had enough information to find the translational kinetic energy gained uh, to deduce what the rotational kinetic energy gained was. And then we worked out the angular velocity of the wheel, and we could then use the energy and the angular velocity to find the rotational inertia. Okay, so rolling, when an object rolls down an incline, it will lose gravitational potential energy, because that's what it starts with, and it will gain translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Therefore, the initial gravitational potential energy is converted to both of these forms, and we end up with an equation that looks like this. Oops, mg delta h is equal to one, oops, one half mv squared plus one half i omega squared. Okay, so if you look at an example of this, so if you have a solid cylinder that rolls down an incline, which has a mass of one kilogram and a radius of 0 0.5 meters, what is its rotational inertia is our first question. i for a solid cylinder is equal to one half m r squared which is one half times one times 0 0.5 squared, which is equal to 0 0.5 times one times 0 0.5 squared, gives us 0 0.125 kilogram meter squared. It reaches a final speed of 4.5 meters per second. What's its final translational kinetic energy? So the translational kinetic energy is um, Ek is equal to 1 half mv squared, which is 1 half times 1 times 4.5 squared.
gives us 10.125 joules. And then the third question, what is its final rotational kinetic energy? Well, we know that omega for a rolling object is V over R. So its final angular speed will be 4.5 over 0 0.5, its radius, which is 9.0 radians per second. And EK rotational is half I omega squared, which is a half times 0 0.125 five times nine squared, which gives us 5.026 joules. Um, and now we know the total energy at the bottom. E total is equal to EK plus EK rotational, which is 10.125 plus 5.026, which is 15.151 joules. What was the height, delta H, that it lost as it rolled down? Okay, so this is the total energy that we've gained. That must also be the total energy that we've lost. So we can say um, mg delta h must be equal to 15.151. So h is equal to 15.151 over mg, and m was 1, and g is 9.81. So we get a final answer of 1.54 or 1.5 meters. So this vertical height here that it, that it must have dropped in order to gain this amount of energy is 1.5 meters. All right, so here's an, another one that allows us just to explain some things using these concepts. We have a hollow cylinder and a solid cylinder with the same mass and radius. We're asked to use energy considerations to determine which one will get down the slope first. So the first step here is um, both start with the same gravitational potential energy. And then the second part of the explanation is to say that as they roll down, they gain translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Okay, that says roll, believe it or not. Let me fix that. All right. Um, the hollow cylinder, well, let's say actually the solid cylinder has a greater rotational inertia so more of its gravitational of its energy more of the energy that it gains I should say more of the energy 
it gains will be converted to rotational oh, sorry I've, I've got this all around the wrong way this should be less the solid cylinder has a lower rotational inertia so less of the energy it gains will be converted to rotational kinetic energy And we can say, therefore, it will gain more translational kinetic energy and travel faster, reaching the bottom first. Okay, so basically the idea is that both of them start with the same amount of energy. The hollow cylinder will gain more rotational kinetic energy, the solid cylinder less. Therefore, the solid cylinder will gain more translational kinetic energy and therefore arrive at the bottom first. All right, one final example. A person on an office chair is rotating with his arms outstretched, holding two weights. This example is a little bit different. So we see his angular speed is two radians per second. His rotational inertia is 20 kilogram meters squared. When he pulls his arms in, his rotational inertia halves and his angular speed doubles. Compare the initial rotational kinetic energy with the final. So one, E K rotational initial is half times 20 times two squared which is 10 times 4, which is 40 joules. E k rotational final is a half times 10 times 4 squared, which is 5 times 16, which is 80 joules. So we can see that the final kinetic energy in this situation is much greater than the initial kinetic energy. Um, we know from our studies of angular momentum that the angular momentum remains constant. However, we see that the kinetic energy does not. The extra kinetic energy must have come from some work that was done in the system. And the only place where work could have been done in this system is in pulling in the masses. So when he moved the masses in, he must have applied a force to the masses which did work on the system. So we can say by moving his arms in, the person did work on the system, causing its rotational kinetic energy to increase. All right, so to summarize, to make an object spin, we have to do work on it. This means that it will gain energy. Rotational kinetic energy is the energy that a spinning object has due to its spinning motion. It's defined by the equation Ek rotational is equal to a half i omega squared. In systems involving rotating objects, we need to consider rotational kinetic energy when applying the principle of energy conservation.